I would love to invite you to stand. We're going to sing some good old, hopefully familiar songs, just lifting our voices, lifting up the name of Jesus. Uh, I want to invite you to sing out with me, and let's lift our voices together. Come on.
that the Father is out looking for. Those who are simply and honestly themselves before Him. That in their worship, they come before Him in their truest selves. You see, God is sheer being itself. God is spirit and those who worship Him must do it out of their very being, out of their spirits. And their true selves bring adoration to God. 
And over the past month, uh, this was the passage that was reverberating in my being all month as I thought about you and I prayed for you and I, I thought about our church and our community here. And it seemed like every time uh, the Holy Spirit kind of dropped this passage at my own personal doorstep, I just began to pray more and more prayers of God. Do we have this kind of vision? Do we have this kind of openness to you? Do we have this kind of dreaming within ourselves as a community, as a body, as a church, that we would be these kinds of worshipers? And you know, I, I wanna say to you, Soul City, it is so good to be home. There is no place like home. Dorothy had it right. And I am so glad to be back in this house. No other house has my heart the way this house has my heart. And it is so good to be with you, but I just wanna say, Soul City, are you ready? <laughs> are you ready to be these kinds of worshipers? The kind of worshipers that Jesus describes, the kind of worshipers that Jesus says, I don't bring any pretense. I don't bring any kind of a false mask before God. I don't come into his house so that I can do some spiritual gymnastics. Jesus is looking for worshipers that will come and they will give everything that they have, that they will bring out every fiber of their being, that when they look at their neighbor and they say, hey neighbor, let me help you lift your hands because I know that you're discouraged. I know that you're hurting. That they say, I'm going to be a person that is dancing with joy and singing with praise and so so city. I want to ask you, are you ready?
the center of our attention. Come on, lift your voices and sing it out together. Come on, lift it up in the name of Jesus.
That's, that's what we're here for, right? I'm here because I want, I want God to awaken my heart, to lead me to life, greater life, more full life, a more meaningful life. I think that's why you're here, whether you recognize it or realize it or not. You long for your heart to be brought to life. We want everyone we know to come to know the love of Jesus, which literally wakes us up and brings our heart to life. You know, religion can't do that. Playing church can't, can't do that, can it? At best, at best, it, it, it can manage your life by attempting to mitigate your sin. But Jesus came for so much more than that. He came to wake you up and to bring you to life. And that's really what we're here for. And if you're new around here, I want to let you know, uh, we've been praying and planning all week that your heart would come to life today. That you would walk out of these doors in about an hour or so closer to him than when you walked in. And that is really why we do everything we do here. We do it because we wanna lead people into a transforming relationship with Jesus. That's why our whole church exists, is to lead people into a heart coming to life, not a superficial Sunday kind of life, a transforming life with Jesus. And if you're new around here, that is what we are all about. And we long for you to experience that. And we want you to know some of the other folks who came here for that today. So what I want you to do is I want you to turn to the person next to you. I want you to look them in the eye and say, I'm so glad you're here. And then give them the most heartfelt high five or if you feel close enough, a bro hug. If you would, <laughs> go ahead and do that and then you can go ahead and grab a seat. Great job, good to see you, Soul City. My name is Jarrett Stevens, and I'm one of the lead pastors here at Soul City. And for the last couple of weeks, uh, my wife Jeannie and I and our kids have actually been away as a family. We pull away uh, every August to rest and to replenish and to hear from God. And we are coming back so filled up and fired up for this next season of ministry. And I just wanna say, it's good to be back with y'all. I missed y'all when I was out on the beach soaking up the rays. I missed you. I thought about you for like 30 seconds, but I did. When I did think about you, I definitely, definitely uh, missed you. If you're new around here and are looking to get connected to what God's doing here, you wanna grow in any way that we can help you do that, there's a card right under your seat. It looks just like this. It's actually tucked into a Bible there, which you're gonna need in a little bit. You can grab this card, fill it out while I'm talking, and then take it at any point after our gathering to our guest services desk on the second floor or first floor lobby. Hand it to one of the folks in the green lanyard. They will do everything they can do to get you connected. And they'll give you a little free gift just to help you do so. So if you're new around here and have never filled this out, this is your fast pass to getting connected, to finding community, and to learning more about how your heart can come to life in a relationship with Jesus. Well, I want to give a special shout out uh, to our student section. Can we honor and bless our students who are sitting right over here? Taking up this section over here. We're so glad they're here, but they are facing a very sad reality. It's Labor Day weekend, and it comes as a mixed bag, doesn't it? It's an awesome weekend, but it also means that summer is winding down. Boo to that. And it means that school is ramping back up. Double boo to that. But we actually wanted to take a moment to mark uh, how significant this season is. Uh, about 370,000 kids will be heading back to a Chicago public school uh, on Tuesday. This Tuesday, some 370,000 kids will walk through the doors of CPS school. And uh, what we have been so proud and so um, grateful for is the partnership that we have with two of those schools. Since we opened our doors as a church, we've been able to grow our partnerships with Brown School and Debt School, which are just west of our church, right next to the United Center. You've probably seen them if you've ever parked over there. We love these schools. We love their students. We love the faculty. We love their families. And this last week, 
as a church, we got to partner with both those schools for the back to school bash. And it was so awesome to see so many Soul City folks out serving and uh, blessing and helping uh, these students have an incredible year and facilitate a fantastic future for them. This is some fun facts from the back to school bash this last week. As a church, listen to this, as a church, you invested $12,000 into brand new school uniforms for 800 students here in CPS. 800 students between these two schools have brand new uniforms because of you. And as a church, you went above and beyond and invested $1,200 into specific classroom needs that the teachers have because the city and the system has fallen short and not given them what they need for the basic supplies. And so you as a church said, well, we can do something about that. And you supplied them with staplers and tape and all kinds of cardboard paper, all kinds of stuff that you did as a church just to say we're with you and we're for you. And I think that is pretty uh, remarkable. And we love the relationship that we have with them. In fact, the, the whole reason we're able to partner like we do with them is because of faithful folks giving generously to God at this church. I don't know if you know this, but as a church, from the very beginning, we've set aside 10% of our budget to go to, to invest in our partnerships, both locally, that would be the schools in this area and a couple other amazing organizations, and globally, as well as to disaster relief and to benevolence care right here within our walls. 10% of our budget right away, every dollar you give, 10% of that, we tithe as a church to invest outside of these walls. And I just wanna say to those of you who give faithfully, regularly, joyfully, thank you. You have no idea how far that little gift, that thing that may, I know you may wrestle with as you give it to God, you have no idea what God does with your faithfulness. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your faithfulness. And if you have yet to get in the game of giving to God and trusting Him with your resources and relinquishing the release they have on your heart, then I want to give you three ways that you can do that right now. Uh, in a moment, we're going to receive our opportunity, our offering to God to trust Him. And we're going to do it three different ways. Old school, where you can drop it in the bucket. Some of y'all love the sound of that money hitting that plastic bucket. And that's just like, mm, that's worship to your ears. Awesome. You can do that. Or you can join the majority of our church, which actually gives online. And you can text in to give. The number's right behind me. You can right now literally text in. And it will get you jump started into doing that or go straight to the site and you can log in there and set up faithful online giving because you have no idea when you do what God does through your generosity and your faithfulness. Before I ask our amazing volunteers to come forward, I thought it'd be great with this uh, being the last weekend of summer for us to pray for every one of the students in this great city of Chicago, to pray for the teachers and faculty and the families of all of our CPS schools. So will you join me right now? Maybe for you it's to open up your hands or even lift a hand. Think of a school maybe that your kids go to. Our kids are two of those 370,000 kids. So maybe if you want to pray in the direction of the school that you're invested in, let's do that right now as we pray for the school. You would join me in praying right now. God, we thank you for a new school year. God, we thank you uh, for every single one of these students, God, every one of them with bright hope and possibility and a future. And so, God, what we pray is we pray for safety as they get to school, safety on the campuses of their school. God, protect them from violence. God, protect them from feuds that have nothing to do with them. God, we pray that for provision in these schools, that our city would wake up and see the investment we have in these children and would go above and beyond to bless their future, God, by investing in them. And God, for every single one of the teachers and faculty that sacrifices, God, would you help them see this is not just another year, but this is the opportunity to invest in a life, to, manif to have a manifold blessing, God, to go well beyond themselves into each one of these students' lives. God, we pray for every teacher every faculty member. And God, we pray for every family connected to every school here in this city, God, that they would see themselves as allies and partners, that there would be a greater bond of love and community, God, that something special would happen between these families as they see we're all in this together. And God, we pray for our city that you would continue to break through. And God, however you want to use this church to step in and to share the light and love of Jesus, we say yes to you, Jesus. God, we love this city. We pray for its schools in your name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask our amazing volunteers to come forward right now as we give back to God. Uh, these last couple of weeks, as we have been resting as a family, our church has been blessed. Y'all didn't get to rest because we've had some amazing speakers over our Voices series. If you missed any one of the last four weeks, go to the podcast, go actually to the website, and you can catch up there. But today, I can't think of a better person 
to close out our Voices series. Today, we have a dear, dear friend of ours speaking this morning, and it's someone that Gene and I have known for over 20 years now. We have the privilege of having Voices alumni speaker, Harvey Carey, come back today. And if you don't know Harvey, listen, you're about to. You're about to get to know him. We uh, first met him when he was working at Salem Baptist Church here in the city of Chicago. We've literally traveled the world with this man. He has been so faithful to God, followed a calling of God to become the pastor of Citadel Faith, Citadel of Faith in downtown Detroit. So we love the work that he's doing in Detroit. And for him to be able to come back and bless us this morning with the message God has given him, I heard it at the 8.30. Y'all are ready for what's about to happen. This man is the real deal. Gene and I love him and trust him and are so proud to call him a friend. Soul City, will you welcome our brother from another mother, Harvey Carey. Hallelujah. Can we give Jesus a hand of praise? He's so awesome. Come on, let's give Jesus a hand of praise. What a mighty God. What a mighty God we serve. Listen, I, am, uh, I, I just leaned over to Jared. I said, only you have so much swag, you can make a floral shirt look cool. <laughs> I mean, seriously, pink flowers on top of that. Go ahead, bro. Um, Listen, you all, uh, I am so thrilled to see what God is doing in this community. I was here when uh, the dust was settling on what you guys had done then, and to see what God is doing, uh, to God be the glory, but even beyond what he's doing inside of these four walls, to see your consistent commitment to our city and to our world. Uh, can you just give God praise for Soul City? This is a great church. So when I got the call inviting me to come and to share, it was just an honor uh, to be here, particularly for this Voices uh, series. So let's go to God in prayer as we approach the word of God together. Father, thank you for the worship that we've lifted in song to you. We pray that your heart was blessed. Thank you, God, for the opportunity that many of us gave to take those resources that you've given to us and give a portion of that back to you in a, in a form of worship. And now we get the joy of sitting around your word together. God, would you let your word do what it always does? Would it be a lamp to our feet, a light on our path? We cannot stumble. We cannot be unsure of our, of our feet when your word directs us. And so would you convict us? Would you encourage us? Would you give us direction? Would you help us have a perspective that would honor you? And when God, when we leave this place, we'll be careful to give you the glory and honor. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I want to share with you all uh, from, the new, from the Old Testament, uh, the book of Numbers, chapter 13, Numbers, chapter 13, beginning at verse 27. And uh, actually in front of you, you I think you have Bibles, and so I think they even have a verse, uh, the page number there. So those of you that would like to do that, please don't feel any pressure to do it. But um, Numbers, chapter 13, beginning at verse 27. It says, they gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev and the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites. They live in the hill country. The Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. And we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. I want to read that last verse or that last sentence again. We, we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. I want to talk today from the subject, having a faith-filled perspective having a faith-filled perspective. You all, I'm getting older, and as I get older, I'm noticing that things are changing. Um, yeah, so there are hair follicles that are no longer present. Um, when I bend down to tie my shoes, it's more of a journey than it used to be. 
But the thing that really is kind of uh, resonating the most about my age is the necessity of these little guys that I'm holding in my hand. Now, I'm nearsighted, which means I can read uh, words fine up close, but if I do not want to murder people along the highway while I'm driving, it's critical that I wear these glasses. What they do is they correct my vision. As I'm getting older and as I'm, uh, you know, kind of becoming more in age, my vision that was once crisp, uh, sharp, I was able to see things. Now my vision, as it is impaired, I need to get some corrective lenses to help that that is not what it used to be. I believe that for many people, we spiritually are kind of like that. That at one point, our vision might have been a bit sharper, our outlook may have been a bit, bit brighter, more optimistic, but through life and the challenges of life, sometimes our vision has become not faith-filled, but fear-filled, not faith-filled, but doubt-filled, not faith-filled, but anxiety-filled, and, and we need some corrective lenses, as it were, so that we could be able to see life in a different way. And I believe the Word of God gives us that correct lens to see life the way it should be. Uh, I want to read to you all uh, kind of the opening of a book that's one of my favorite books. You guys may recognize this. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. So Charles Dickens opens up this book, A Tale of Two Cities, looking at the outlook of the city and seeing two different destinies, one of them positive, one of them negative, one of them optimistic, one of them very pessimistic. And indeed, that's how life is often, isn't it? That people can look at the same thing, people can look at the same set of circumstances, one of them believing that, yes, we're well able to do it, another saying it is impossible to do it. And that's where we find ourselves here in the book of Numbers, seeing this account that is being given. So let me give the backstory to what had occurred. Many of you may know the children of Israel are the children of God. These are the chosen people of God. And one of the promises that he made to them is that one day I'm going to give you your own land, and it will be a very bountiful land, a very abundant land flowing with milk and honey. And so Moses is now at the edge of the promised land and sends some spies into the land, spies to kind of investigate what are the things we're going to run into, what are the different things that we need to be aware of as we enter into what God has promised. And so now they're coming back to give the report of what they found, and it's here in Numbers 13, verse 27. Look at it here. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. So they said, we, we went as you instructed, and as we got in there, we see that it's an amazingly abundant land, amazingly full of great agricultural, uh, abound, just boundless in that. As a matter of fact, here is its fruit. We brought back some of the fruit that we found in that land. But then they changed their view of what they saw. They said, look at the next verse. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw the descendants of Anak there. And then they kind of gave a, a list of the various armies and the people groups that were there, the Amalekites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Canaanites, these very organized, very uh, long-standing civilizations. They had gathered in different parts of the Promised Land. And so these these spies came back saying, you know what, we went in and we saw that the land that God promised, it does have great abundance. We brought back some of the fruit. However, even though it is great, you know, greatly resourced, we saw that the cities are fortified and the enemies are great and they're stronger than we are. We can't go in and attack these people. Isn't it interesting how when God makes a promise, it's often met with a challenge, and I don't know, I don't know if anybody, any of you all, when you became a Christian, didn't read the fine print, you know? But for many of us, we thought that the moment that we became Christians, it was just going to be like walking, like tiptoe through the tulips kind of thing, right? Oh, when I come to know Jesus, everybody's going to like me. I'm not going to have any issues. As a matter of fact, I remember a story of a lady down in Mississippi uh, at a testimonial service, one of the little small churches, and she got up and she said, first giving honor to God who's the head of my life. I want to thank God for the pastor. And I just want to mention I've been saved for 23 years and I've not run into the devil one time. The pastor said, would you bow your head and ask Jesus to come into your heart, please? <laughs> she said, what do you mean? I told you I've been saved for 21 years. He said, no, the reason that you've not encountered him is that you were running with him. 
It's impossible to be on God's team and not have the opposite of God's team fighting you. So the Bible says in this world, you will have trials and tribulations, but be of good cheer because he's overcome it. But here we are in a situation where the promised land is within reach, the promised land, but there's doubt and there's fear because of what they see. I wonder how many of us have been given promises of God. How many of us have been given given promises from his word? Maybe God has spoken something into your own heart, a dream, a vision, an idea that you know was from him. But now the circumstances and the situations that are in front of us make us doubt what God has said. They said we can't do it, impossible. We see how many enemies there are. We see they're very large people. The cities are fortified in the natural, in the natural, in our own strength. We can't do it. Who even told them that it's going to be in their strength? And let me just say this, by the way. By the time it came for them to enter into the promised land, you do know it had nothing to do with their strength. They started walking around the whole city, and then the seventh time, they just started making a lot of noise, and the whole city just, boom, the whole walls came down, and they went in. That's how they won. And here you are trying to figure out, well, if I get a degree, and if I get my five-year plan, and if I get this kind of, if I network a little bit more, and if I get my social media presence, if I brand myself, if you do all that, you still ain't going to get no money. Ain't nobody going to know you. It's about God. And by the way, By the way, when things are funny and you don't laugh, you are a very depressed person. (laughs) You know, there's funny stuff going on and you just still got a fake. We're going to talk about you in a second. Here we go. (laughs) So so after they gave this negative report, you all, uh, Caleb silenced the people before Moses. If you all remember, Caleb is one of the, the spies who had a very different perspective than the other 10. Not only Caleb, but also Joshua had a different perspective. And this is what Caleb says. Caleb says, listen, we should go up and take possession of the land. Why? For we can certainly do it. Caleb said, you know what? I believe that we should go up right now and take possession because we can do it. How can one person look at one situation one way and another person look at the same situation and they see it another way? I believe because one person has lenses or has vision or has a mindset of faith and the others have vision or insight or a mindset of fear. And all of us as human beings are given this amazing gift called free will. Unlike animals that often just move by instinct, we have choice And we have the choice to either walk in faith, believe, or to walk in fear and doubt. Now, you all, whether you know it or not, you're a believer if you're a Christian. So believer kind of means believe. Just a thought. Believe. But what happens when doubt, what happens when the things that we see in the natural make us so fearful? It ends up canceling out sometimes the very faith that requires us to actually enter into what God has promised. So I need you to see here. So right after, right after Caleb silences the people, notice what happens next in verse 31. But the men who had gone up with him says, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. So he said, Caleb says, we should do it right away. He said, no, 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 we can't do it because they're stronger than we are. How did they know that they're stronger than they are? They hadn't arm wrestled them. They hadn't gotten, they, how did they know that they were stronger than they were? Could it have been their perception? Could it have been, again, their perspective? You all, I wonder how many of us are missing the blessings of God because the circumstances and the situations of our lives make us doubt God. There's a story in scripture where Jesus was uh, traveling with the disciples and he was in the, the Bible said he was in the hinder part, or he was in the bottom part of the ship and the storm came and, the, and the, the, the water started getting to the boat. Now you do know if you're at the kind of bottom of the boat and water's coming into the boat, you get the water first. Jesus is chilling on a pillow, slobbering a little bit. I believe some Holy Spirit anointed slob that was coming out of his mouth. And as he's knocked out sleeping, the disciples come, you may remember, and they wake him up and they say, Jesus, don't you care? That's an oxymoron. I mean, Jesus, don't you even care that we are perishing? How many of us, when life circumstances 
come at us and, and the winds and the waves and the oppositions and the, the, the cities that seem fortified, the impossibilities are before us. Many of us, like the disciples, we end up saying, Jesus, if you cared about us, if you cared about me, you would not allow this situation to be in front of me. And so many of us begin to doubt God because of what we see as opposed to what he said. Do you know that if Jesus is on the boat, you ain't going to drown? Listen, y'all, if Jesus is on the doggone boat, you need to take a nap to grab another pillow. Listen, Jesus, Jesus is so bad. If he wanted to, if the water filled it up, it would have become the first submarine. How many of you may not know Jesus is in your boat? Jesus is with you. And if God be for you, who can be against you? Amen. Now in the 20 minutes and 49 seconds I got left, I want to remind some of you who may not know about this being excited around the Bible teaching moment. I'm black and I've been that way a long time. And in my cultural context, when things get a little bit uh, exciting or resonate, we say things like amen or praise God or, you know, hallelujah. And I understand some of us and our personality types are not that way. I get it. I get it. Harvey, I'm so excited to know that you have so much energy. That really, uh, that's so encouraging to me. I, I, love, I love it. I love it. Man, I'm not going to go to sleep today. I tell you that much. But that's not how I'm wired. That's just not my personality type. That's just not my, you know, that's just not how I'm, I'm just not how I'm designed. Liar, liar, you. Because you are designed that way. I've watched you in the spirit at a football game. I've watched you at a basketball. Don't you tell me. Don't you tell me you don't have in your personality to get loud. There are people that you don't know, people that have never done anything for you because they're throwing a piss can through the air. You are screaming. You are hugging strangers. You are painting your face over some people who ain't done nothing for you. But when I think about Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Thank God. Is there anybody here that loves the Lord? Give him a praise in here. Hallelujah. So for the next few minutes, all of y'all are uh, black for the next 15 minutes. <laughs> you can tweet that. You can put that on your Instagram. I was black for 15 minutes. <laughs> so on one side, you all, we have Caleb giving a faith-filled perspective that, you know what? Let's go up right now and take possession of it. Let's go into what God has promised because we are able to do it. But now we hear the report, no, we can't because they are stronger than we are. But listen, you all, uh, once fear begins to grow, fear begins to do more damage than just to you. Because then it says in the next verse, and not only did they, listen, not only did they operate in fear and doubt and unbelief and anxiety, but they wanted to send an Evite to other people to join them. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they explored. So not only did they have this view, this negative opinion, this negative uh, outlook and insight about the situation, but they said, I need to help have other people kind of have the same view. Have you ever seen a uh, Peanuts uh, cartoon with Pigpen? He's a little guy that has dirt that just follows him everywhere he goes. Or uh, there's another cloud guy that has like a little rain cloud that follows him wherever he goes. And some of us, that's how we are. And some of us unknowingly actually want others to join our pity party. And you know what? It doesn't mean that your situations are not real. Please, please do not leave this place feeling like we've minimized what may be some really serious things you're dealing with. Sometimes when you come to church and you hear preachers or whomever kind of say things that kind of seem like they're trivializing maybe cancer, maybe trivializing being laid off, maybe trivializing a relationship that's been broken. And I mean, it could be very hard. You all, I, I like you, am in the midst of looking at things in the natural and it can seem overwhelming. This is my hometown, but every time I come and I turn on the news, you can't imagine how, in Detroit, which they said was a bad city, 
It's not as bad as far as violence as my hometown, Chicago, where every other few minutes somebody's being brutally shot or profiled or whatever. And then as I turn on national news, it seems like even there's more visceral activity, right? As we look at our world, the uncertainty of it, people running for safety from their homelands with children in arm, and that's all they have are the clothes on their back. Wars and rumors of wars, sometimes it can just be overwhelming, right? And so you all, I'm not minimizing the pain of this, and I'm not trivializing the severity of what you may be going through, what all of us collectively are going through, but what I'm saying is this, we have a choice. We can either look at life and look at our situations through the lenses of doubt, unbelief, anxiety, and fear, or we can choose to look at the life that we've been given through the lenses of faith in God. And I'm suggesting that we look at life through the lenses of faith in God. Not only did they say that they couldn't do it, but they said, you know what, let's spread a bad report. Let's tell other people you can't do it. Not only can I get that job, but you can't get that job. Not only, not only is it not going to get better uh, here, but it's not going to get better in our nation. No, it's not going to get better in the world. No, our situation. Now, negative begins to beget negative. And it begets negative, and it begets negative. And now they spread the bad report to the rest of Israel. But now look what happens next. It says, the land we explore devours those living in it. So now they've moved from a selfish view of doubt, a self-driven view of anxiety and fear, to now one that involves other people. Now they're flat out lying. The land was not eating people up. They did not see that. They saw fruit, they saw cities, they saw armies, but they did not see a horror movie of the land devouring people. Okay, lest you laugh. Let me show you how your life is full of fear. When, when a pain comes, uh-oh. Oh, cancer. Oh, 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 yep, that's definitely a lump right there. That's, I'm gonna die, <laughs> right? Something comes in the mail, oh. The boss calls you, oh, every situation that you face all of a sudden becomes so much bigger than what it is. Fear, false evidence appearing real. And for many of us, we are being driven by fear, and we are not people of fear. We are people of faith. We are believers, amen. They doubted so much, they feared so much that they began to now exaggerate. The land is actually swallowing people up and the people are of great size. And then they end with these words and I wanna use this as a transition. They said in this last sentence, verse 33, <clears throat> we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. Look at that. We seemed like grasshoppers, we seemed small, we seemed insignificant in our own eyes, and, and look at this, and we looked the same to them. Which means that the way in which people perceived them was directly connected to how they perceived themselves. A grasshopper mentality that they held created a grasshopper mentality that others held about them. And could it be that for many of us, we have views of ourselves Views of our capacity, views of our ability, views of what God has called us to do that's so small, that's so seemingly insignificant that we see ourselves as incapable, unable, when God says that that's not the way that I see you. And because we see ourselves that way, maybe others see the same. I don't know about you, but there's some people that have jobs where uh, you wonder, how did my boss become my boss? How in the world am I answering all their questions and they getting paid more money than me? How is it that new people will come in and I train them and then they get over me? How is that? Have you watched their attitude? Some of those people are the most aggressive people. They show up and they act like they're knowing what they're doing even though you know that they don't know what they're doing. And you know what you're, you know what you're doing but you're too, you're too shy. You're too afraid. You're too unsure. unsure. They, listen, they don't even know what they're saying, but they say it with boldness, right? 
and you know what to say, but you're too afraid to even say it. And their attitude determines their altitude. And your attitude is determining sometimes your altitude. They seem like grasshoppers in their own eyes, and that's how others saw them. When I got called to preach you all, I felt like a grasshopper because I was called to preach in the Black Baptist Church, you all, and I mean, man, and I'm, I, you know, and some, some black people are light-skinned, and you can, you know, you're not, you're not sure. <laughs> <laughs> when you see me, you know I'm black. It ain't no like, it ain't no, I wonder, is he really black? You know in the dough, <laughs> black. And so here I am in the Black Baptist Church, you all, and you're supposed to preach if you're called to preach like a black preacher. And for those that don't know that, there is a certain way that many black preachers preach. And if you do not preach that way, you are invalidated from being a real preacher. And so <laughs> one day I decided <laughs> that I was going to preach this way right here yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and as i did it people started leaving in crowds they did and then i went down to dallas dallas baptist university of southern baptist school and and i learned how to stand in one place and learn homiletics and hermeneutics and and and, and rise and fall and stand in one place and three points and a pointer and a clicker and i did that and the whole church left when i did that so I wasn't white enough to be white. I wasn't black enough to be black. And here I am spitting on the front row. God bless you. Thank you, gentlemen, for... And sweating like a mule. And I just wonder, like, who in the world will ever listen to someone who sweats so much, who spits so much, who doesn't preach black, who doesn't preach white? Then I was reminded that I was wonderfully and fearfully made. And child of God, you are one of a kind. Stop seeing yourself small. Stop seeing yourself as a grasshopper. Start seeing yourself as a child of God, made in the image of God, an overcomer, the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. See yourself that way. Amen. Amen. As a person thinks in their heart, that's who you are. No one will ever like me. That's why don't nobody like you. <laughs> no one will ever be my friend. That's why. That's why. <laughs> Leave home the next tomorrow and say, everybody's going to be my friend. People on the bus, people at my job, people at McDonald's, everybody. <laughs> All right, I'm almost done. <laughs> so, Harvey, you've built the case. You've built the case that... We can have two perspectives about, about life. We can either look at life through the lenses of fear and doubt and anxiety. That creates not only our own personal kind of negativity, but it also kind of increases the, the net of that to other people. And it has an effect that's really negative, not just for us, but for the people that are around us. We, we, can, have a, we can have a fear-filled perspective, but we also, by choice, can have a faith-filled perspective, one that sees life the way that God sees it, the way that his word sees it. So you built that case, I get it. But I don't know how to do that, Harvey. How do you do that? I'm glad you asked. The answer is found in Philippians chapter four, verse six. Not gonna be long, here's the answer. And the, and it should be, the page number should be on the screen if you wanna turn it. Philippians four and six, it says this. Here it is. Do not be anxious about anything. If your thing is under the category of anything, <laughs> don't be anxious about it. Oh, but what about that thing? Is it a thing? <laughs> now, if your thing ain't a thing, then be anxious all day. But if your thing under the category of thing, don't be anxious about it anything pastor why not because jesus is in charge listen when you when you know this when you know god's in charge it changes how you view things it gives you a set of knowledge 
that changes your perspective. I often use this story because I grew up watching Batman on TV. Some of y'all don't know nothing about Batman, but Batman, back in the day, Zonk Powell's, you know, that, the old Batman, the multicolored coat of many colors, uh, Robin and Batman. So anyway, back in the day, the television show Batman came on every day, and every single day that Batman was on TV, Batman was getting ready to die. Every single episode, Batman was getting, somebody was getting ready to kill Batman every single day. And I remember going to the kitchen one time, I just couldn't take it. My poor little heart could not take it. I ran, I ran to my mom and said, Mama, they about to kill Batman! <laughs> my mother started stirring the greens, she said, baby, if they kill Batman, what's going to be the name of the show? <laughs> I said, I don't know. Uh, Alfred, uh, Commissioner, I don't know. In my mind, you insensitive woman. <laughs> no idea what I'm going through in this living room, and you have the nerve to ask me what will be the name of the show. She said, I'm a prophet. <laughs> she said, I prophesy, go back into the living room, son. And if you can, just sit down and watch the show, and I prophesy, Batman is not going to die. <laughs> With an attitude, I went back into the living room. I sat down. My face was set like stone, knowing that they about to kill him. It's the end of my life as we know it. What's go what is the world going to be like without Batman? But I sat there anyway, and he was on a conveyor belt, you all. At the end of the conveyor belt, there was a saw that was getting ready to cut him in half. But, but he had a utility belt, and some of y'all don't know, he had a utility belt, and inside of Batman's utility belt was anything that you needed an answer to. Any situation, any circumstance, any obstacle, there was an answer in the utility belt. He wiggled his way out of the restraints, reached into his utility belt, and of course, he had a spray that was able to take steel and make it disintegrate. He sprayed it, the steel disintegrated, Batman got off the conveyor belt, and he lived. Well, I came to tell you, from that day forward, every time I watched Batman, my heart didn't beat. I didn't get all stressed out. I didn't get anxious. Why? Because I knew in the end, he would win. Guess what, Soul City? I read the end of the book, and... We win! We win! <laughs> we win! So he says, don't be anxious about anything. Not yet, not yet, not yet. <laughs> we go in there though. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, Present your request to God. Now, Soul City, I, I need you to hear this, but if you don't hear anything else. Sometimes you look at this energy and say, oh, Harvey, what energy? Where does it come from? It comes from thanksgiving. The reason that I move the way I do and I praise the way I do is because I'm thankful. Some of y'all may not know, but years ago, I was sent home to hospice to die. Unable to walk, unable to speak, unable to use the bathroom, had a feeding tube in my stomach keeping me alive. But God said, I'm not done with you. And I unplugged that machine and I'm walking and I'm talking and I'm praising. So why am I inviting you to give thanks because when you look back over your life and remember what God has done for you let the redeemed of the Lord say something give him some praise give him some praise soul city is there anybody here that knows that God is good, then give him praise in this house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The last thing God says, and we're finished. He says, and then I promise you, when you do what you just did, he says, and the peace of God that goes beyond what makes sense will guard your heart and your mind through Christ. Child of God, you came in here broken, some of you. You came in here uncertain about our world, uncertain about our city, uncertain about your life. But there's a God who's not uncertain. There's a Jesus who's not unsure. 
And he's inviting you to have faith and no more fear. Faith and no more anxiety. Faith and no more doubt. And when you do it, choose that perspective. He'll give you peace. And it'll pass understanding. Whatever is true, whatever is lovely, whatever is a good report. If there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think about that. Soul City, God wants to do in you as a church and in you individually some things that are going to blow your mind. But you got to stop seeing yourself like a grasshopper and see yourself like a child of God that you are. Can we pray together? Heavenly Father, you're holy, you're righteous, you're pure. Thank you so much for this amazing opportunity that we have come together to walk on the water. Because God, that was an impossible thing to do. But Jesus, you said, come. And as you called Peter out of the boat, he walked on an impossibility. He did what seemed humanly impossible. You invite us to that, God, to begin to walk on the circumstances and situations of our lives because you call us out of the boat into the troubled waters to walk upon them. And so now, God, would you give your people faith-filled perspectives that we would see our lives through the lenses of faith and no longer fear, no longer doubt, no longer anxiety. And God, we give you the glory for what you're doing and what you're yet to do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.
you glad you came this Sunday? Aren't yeah. you glad you were here? Can we thank God for Pastor Harvey Carey, the word he had for us today? And I just want, I want to say this. We say it every week, but boy, I think maybe it just might connect with you today. If there is anything going on in your life that has shifted your perspective from faith to fear, I'd love to invite you to our prayer hall. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to have God speak in, speak peace over your life to shift that perspective. And our prayer team would love to meet with you, would love to pray for you for whatever may be going on, how you see yourself, what you see around you. Would you let us pray over you? We'd love for you to join us. It's right in our second floor lobby. Anyone and everyone is welcome. In fact, it may be the whole reason that you came today is to go to our prayer hall. And then right next to the prayer hall, Harvey and Jeannie and I will be there in the study. We'd love to say hey to you if we haven't met you, if we haven't seen you for a while, we would love to see you there. And then I just wanna let you know this, before Harvey wants to say one thing in close, I wanna say this. Next weekend is a big weekend for us. Next weekend is Baptism Sunday. It's a day of celebration where we celebrate what transformation looks like in public. And you may be thinking, oh, it's Baptism Sunday. It's kind of a off week. No. No, it's like mega on next week. You don't want to miss it. It is such a celebration of God's faithfulness. And if you have yet to say yes to entering into the waters of baptism, you've said yes to Jesus, maybe recently, maybe as a kid, but you have yet to say yes to baptism. What are you waiting for? We want to celebrate your baptism with us. You can go online and register or just, as you know how we do it right here, just show up next week and we will (laughs) baptize you. Do not miss next weekend. It's going to be an awesome weekend. I know, Harvey, you want to say a word real quick. Yeah, I just want to say this real quick, you all. I, um, when I got the invitation and got a little text uh, from this couple uh, as they were spending some time together, uh, I just wanted to affirm you uh, in how important it is and how valuable when you allow your leadership some time away with God and some time with each other. Uh, about four years ago, I ended up spending one year uh, on a sabbatical uh, because I, I had pretty much getting ready to crash and burn because I did not do that. I did not properly learn how to do Sabbath correctly, and I knew that I was kind of ra- running into a train wreck. So I just want to applaud you all for the, um, the mindset and the encouragement that you are giving to this couple and these leaders. Amen. And so God bless you. Uh, can I pray? Yeah, I would love to. Yeah. Let's pray together. God, thank you again for this couple, for these leaders that you have gifted this church with. But thank you so much for the people that are here today. Each and every person was here for a reason, and we pray that we would leave this place with new perspectives and insights about our lives and the world around us. We're so careful to give you glory and praise, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you, y'all. We'll see you next week. God bless.